Hello fellow techies, I'm Matt Pierce. Welcome to my Cyber Garage. In today's 10 minute trainer, we're gonna discuss the GreenShot screen capture utility. We begin by discussing two topics, why you might need the screenshot utility and why Windows native screenshot tools fall short. Let's begin. So why might you need a screenshot utility? Well, let's start with the definition of what a screenshot is. It's a static picture of a computer screen captured and saved as an image. So yes, you definitely want a screenshot utility for things such as a research paper per school. Here is a research paper from my college days, and that's three different R graphs that are put inside of a Word document, and it helps articulate what's going on. It's very handy. Uh, maybe you'll have Excel charts or Excel graphs. Maybe you have a Wikipedia picture. There's lots of reasons why in a research paper or paper for school, you'd want to have a screenshot utility to take pictures. Training. Maybe you have a Microsoft Edge browser settings that you want to configure and coordinate with your grandpa and show them how to set something up. Maybe there's internet, DSL, or uh, Wi-Fi settings that you have to walk into. It's very handy to have a screenshot to communicate with. Uh, bug reports, another excellent example. A, a picture is worth a thousand words when it comes to a bug report. You're trying to describe what's going on. Here's the repro steps. Here's the expected results picture. Here's the actual results. That's the real money maker there. Having a picture of the actual results. You can show the state of the error. And with a screenshot utility, the better ones anyway, you can annotate. That's what all these red little blurbs are. You can annotate what's wrong or what's right with a picture. So screenshots, very handy, bug reports. <laughs> you can support troubleshooting with screenshots. You can do temporary backups. Sometimes I'll make some settings changes and if there's a few too many to remember, I'll just take a quick screenshot and then click apply or implement them and then I can roll them back easily. Uh, and I chuckled when I read this one online, a tweet <laughs> for people who are into Twitter. If they want to capture a tweet before it's gone, they can get a screenshot of it. Emails. I use screenshots and emails all the time, and I'll walk through that at the end of this video, how I label them with figures and whatnot, but it really helps communicate in the emails with screenshots. Now, there's also reasons that you wouldn't use a screenshot utility. One might be that you already have a screenshot utility, the native ones that are built into Windows. If you use the Windows, Shift, and S keys all at once, that'll let you pick a range on any of your screens and capture that natively from Windows. Windows also has the Windows and print screen keys, which will capture all your screens. So in my case, I have a laptop plus two monitors. If I hit the Windows and print screen, I would get a screenshot with three screens. And then the Windows snipping tool. That's another option that you can use. But it's not all that easy to use. And another reason, sometimes you just want to use a cell phone. For me, there's occasions when I just want to text message a screenshot. It's way quicker just to without phone, take a picture and send it in the text message. It'd take too much time to, from the PC, take a screenshot and then send the screenshot from the PC to my phone, probably through email, it's just too many steps. So that is when you would use a screenshot utility and when you wouldn't. So why would Windows native tools fall short? Let's start by looking at the simplest two, the Windows key and print screen here in red, Windows key, print screen, or in green, the Windows key and the Shift key and the S. Uh, the first will do all monitors, all screens, a snapshot of that, and the region will let you select the region. Let me demonstrate the region really quickly for you. So I'm going to Windows key, Shift, and S. All of my screens go gray. I move my mouse point around, and as soon as I left click, I start selecting a range, and I'm going to select an oddball range here and I'm, I haven't let my finger off mouse pointer, as soon as I do let my finger off mouse pointer, it captures a screenshot and throws it to the clipboard. And to demonstrate that, from my other screen, I'm gonna drag over an empty Outlook message. I should be able to right click and paste, and that screenshot should come in. Now, interesting note, I just did this on a video and had to redo this snippet of video. The paste didn't work, <laughs> so the windows Screen capture can be a little bit flaky. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but in general it does. So that is how that works. Now the strengths of this simple built-in native screenshot tool is that it copies all screens, 
with one option or a region with the other, which is good. It's always available, which is good. You don't have to install anything. Every PC comes with that built in. So sometimes you might have a server or something else where you're logged into, remote desktop into, you need to take a screenshot. These options will work for you. And it's simple. So those are three good things about these two approaches. However, it only outputs to the clipboard. And that's not so great. And it also has no annotations or effects. And we'll see later how beneficial those can be and why you would want to use a screenshot or some other tool so that you can get access to those annotations and effects. Now let's move along to the snipping tool that also comes with Windows. Uh, if you've ever clicked the Windows button and typed in snip, this little guy comes up here and you can click on it. It's a good tool in that it copies the region. You can select a range and it's always available just like these up here. However, it's awkward to use. You have to hit the Windows key, type in snip, click on this icon when it comes up, and then the application comes up, but you have to click new to take a snip, and then you gotta select your region. It's just a lot of steps and it's awkward. And it also outputs to a clipboard only. And uh, finally, it's got limited annotations and effects. Uh, unlike this option up here, which has nothing, zero, zip, annotations, or effects, this one has a few, some paint brushes and pens, but they're kind of awkward to use. And that's why the Windows native tools fall short, and why using something free like Green, Green Shot is a, a good option. Next, we'll discuss downloading and installing Green Shot. So to download and install Green Shot, browse the URL to HTTPS, and slash slash getgreenshot.org slash downloads. And I'll include the link below the video in, in the description section. That way you can just click on that rather than type it out. Uh, once the browser comes up, it'll come to a screen that has a part of the screen that looks like this. Click on the latest stable Windows version to download. And interestingly, they have a Mac version as well. Once the download is completed, in your lower left corner, it'll say that it's up. Just double click on the downloaded file and that'll run it. And then use the friendly wizards just to walk through all the selections and use defaults as you go along. Select English as the language, click the I accept the license window, click next. Use a default location unless you want a path that's different, click next. Uh, there's a bunch of different components. Just go with the default components unless you want them all or have custom ones that you want. Click next, just walk your way through the wizard. Once the wizard's done and it's installed, the first time that you go to run GreenShot, here's the lower right of my uh, computer and the system tray, my little clock. And anyway, GreenShot for me happens to show up in this window. If you don't have a lot of stuff installed, it may show up on the base tray. But you'll want to run this GreenShot the first time and I'll configure some stuff. Uh, once it's been run, it'll run from a print screen thereafter. Next on the agenda, we're going to demonstrate two different features, capturing the screenshots and outputting the screenshots to a given target. So next, we're going to demonstrate capturing the screenshots. So GreenShot is installed. And anytime I hit the print screen key, it's going to intercept that and it's going to fire. So here I have Windows File Explorer up, and I want to take a screenshot of just this area. So I can click on whatever I want. So I'll select, say, the seventh MP4 that's part of this video. All the snippets get put together in. So I'll take and uh, hit the print screen key. And there we go, green shot is now active. Notice that I put my mouse pointer way down here because it's frozen. The screenshot, as soon as I hit print screen, everything stops. But I can move the green shot mouse pointer. So I, I'm moving it along and I'm moving up here. And notice the zoom window, the circle that's really zoomed in. Uh, there's here, let's see. Maybe I want to go to this upper left corner right here. Now I can use the cursor keys in that zoom window and I can go pixel at a time, right click, right click, right click on the, those, and then I'm on the line, and now I go up, 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 up to this line, and then I left click. That anchors my upper left corner. Now I'm holding the mouse pointer down, scrolling, 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 and then I want to line up right on that blue bar, so I'm going to use the cursors again, and I'm still holding the mouse pointer down. Click, click, 
That was left, left, up, up. One more up. Oh, that went too far. One down. I'm still holding the mouse pointer, and now I'm going to let go of the mouse pointer, and boom, it has now captured that screenshot. And the important part there was that I was fine-tuning the mouse pointer movements with the cursor keys up, down, left, and right, holding the mouse pointer down the whole time. And I did it at the starting click, and I did it at the ending click of the range. So very handy to do that. Now moving along, now that I have the image captured, I have lots of different options of what to do with that image. I can send it to MS Paint. And a little, not too frequently, but sometimes I'll send it directly to MS Paint because I want to resize or do some of the features in there, but it's pretty rare. Um, I never go to Excel, Word, PowerPoint, OneNote, Outlook, never do that. Any of those, I would send it to the clipboard first, then go open the document up and paste it in. I never send it to the printer. So basically, MS Paint, I use a little bit. Copy to the clipboard, I use about 20% of the time when I don't want to do any editing. I just want the screenshot and I'm going straight in to Outlook to paste it in a message or to Word to paste it in. But again, only 20% of the time of the year do I use that. And I never use the save as or save directly. You know what I use 80% of the time? Open an image editor. It's very powerful. Now there is an alternative way to use screenshot to capture a screenshot. You don't have to use the print screen key. That's one of many. Let's go down. You're not going to be able to see it. It's off screen, but I'm clicking on my uh, tray icons and there's the green shot app. So I'm going to click the green shot app. It comes up. Now notice that I can capture a region with the print screen key. That's what we did last time. I can capture the last region. So just hit shift and print screen and it'll get the exact same dimensions and location on screen as you did the last time. I can capture a window with alt print screen and then go select the window. I can capture the full screen all left or right. So I have three monitors and that's why it's giving me those options. Um, I can capture a window from a list. You know, there's a couple times when I want to use the image editor. And so I have an image from somewhere else in the clipboard and I can pull it into the green shot editor by using open image from clipboard. So that's other ways that you can use to capture an image. Next on the agenda, we'll discuss the green shot image editor and all the powerful annotations and effects that it has that'll spice up your screenshots. So I've zoomed in my screen here and I have the green shot image editor up. I've taken the screenshot and I selected the output to be the green shot image editor. And we're gonna walk through all of these different features over here. I'm gonna start by drawing a box. So I'll click on the draw box rectangle and actually I'm going to set this to what the defaults are. And let's say I want to draw a box around these three files. So I select it. Now notice it's all blue and it's opaque. I don't want that. I want a green. Let's change this. Let's change the fill color to transparent and apply. Now I can see through. Let's change the green line to a red line and hit apply. So there, now I have a red line. And as long as I don't click off of that box, I can resize it with the anchor points. I can change the color. All these features up here apply. I can add a shadow or take the shadow off, add the shadow back on, change the line thickness, etc. So I can do all of these things as long as it's highlighted. But once I click off of it, if I click off, it's going to add a square. Uh, Control Z to undo. Or I could have just clicked one of these buttons. But that's it. Now I cannot go back and edit this. I can only undo it with Control Z. But that is a box, transparent or full. A circle operates the same way. I can draw a circle. Uh, oh, and if I draw a circle or a square, oblong, just kind of cigar shape. But if I hold the Shift key down, it'll make it perfectly circular. It keeps the proportions. The same with the rectangle. If I keep it square, even though my, you know, without without the shift key, it's rectangle. With the shift key, it's a perfect square. So that's a handy feature as well. Control undo, control undo. All the other fill, line color, thickness, shadow, they're the same on the circle and the square. Uh, freeform. I like the freeform. There are times that I want it to look like a pencil circle. So I just do that, and there we go. That is what the freeform does. 
and you could sometimes I might want to write something that's one way to write it like a pencil control Z to undo uh, let's see drawing a line here's the line object I can click it once drag let go and there's my line uh, control Z control Z control Z I can also with a line left click drag hold the shift key down and it's going to snap to grid points so I can keep it perfectly horizontal perfectly vertical or it'll snap at you know different angles that's like yeah it's, is that 45 degrees not quite I don't know what it's doing 0, 15, 30. I don't know. Anyway, the shift key lets you snap. So that's handy. And the arrow key is nice. It has an arrow at the end. Um, I didn't show you earlier. The arrow key has a fill color, a line color, a line thickness, a pixel size. Well, that's the pixel size there. It has the arrowhead. Do you want it at the starting point, the ending point, both or none? And right now it's at the ending point. But I have all those options. I could make it both. I could make it starting point. I could make it none, which would be the same as a line. I like to leave it defaulted at uh, end point. If I go back to line, I just have line thickness and shadow. Uh, oh, these are very interesting. This little guy down here is a counter. So if I click that and it's blue and I just click it once right right in the middle of the crosshairs boom it gives me a one and if I go right here boom it gives me a two boom it gives me a three those are really nice if you're gonna write up an email or a word document and you have four or five things going on on the screen it's very nice to use these little counters and go one two three four five boom boom and then in my text I could write one something 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 two and add specific text to it now they have an anchor point as long as it's active once you move off of it it's gone you can't change it with that anchor point I could stretch it hold the shift key to make it uniform I'm going to control NZ undo it <laughs> wow got all those remembered each of those points anyway I'll just delete it I'm going to highlight it I can delete too and let's see I'm curious if I start over is it going to start at five again yes it is so they have the system built smart but uh, you can't drag it and drop it. That is a big disappointment because it would have been nice to be able to drag and go, oh, oh, look at that. You can actually. So there's my mouse pointers left and right to move up and down pixels. But once I move off, let me click. Now, it's, now I can never go back to it and move it. So that is the counters. Those are handy. Highlights are another one that I really like to use here. So click on the highlight. And let's say I wanted to highlight this. It's just a range, click, drag, and let go of the mouse pointer. Boom, highlighted. And it has anchor points. I can make it bigger, smaller. Oops, I moved off of it. Let me undo, undo. It's undoing all those little movements over there. But I want to get rid of the. Man, I did a lot of movements. There. Now I'm going to re highlight it again, but this time I'm going to do about half. And while it's still the active object, I can use the cursor keys and move it up or move it down to fine tune the location, as well as drag and drop it. But if I was just a couple off, I could use the up, 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 up arrow key to get it zero, dialed in. Uh, I never use the text or the speech bubble. They're just kind of awkward to use, so I don't use those too. Sometimes I use the text, but it's rare. Uh, frequently, I'll take the image paste it into Word or paste it into Outlook and if I have specific text I'll use their text objects to attach in a text box and overlay it. But that is the basic annotations that you can add to a screenshot. In the next video I'm going to walk through the special effects. Now that we've finished annotating and adding drawings to the Screen. I've cleared them all here but uh, now it's time to finish off the screenshot so the first thing we may want to do is use this obfuscate button here and you'll want to do that for one of two reasons but let me first show you what it does so let me click on the obfuscate uh, there's two different types 
I can pixelize or blur. I prefer blurring. So let's say that we want to hide all of these lower files. So I highlight the range and, and I can undo it just by dragging that panel over it. But I want to hide all of those and maybe I want to focus on five only. And I want to hide all of these. So there, now you're just focused on file number five and if there's sensitive healthcare information or private finance information, whatever, now it's all obscured and only the one you want to discuss is visible. So that's blurring. You have to get the blur radius right. If I drop it down, you can see. So I got to keep it up two, you can see three, four. Now you can't quite make it out. Five, six, by the time you get to seven, now you can't make it out at all. So uh, there's a shadow, there's, I don't know what preview quality does. There's a blur radius, a line thickness. I pretty much leave all those alone. Uh, that's blur. Pixelize. That's what pixelize looks like. And it also has pixel size. And if you have it down to two, you can read it. Three, it starts getting blocky, but you can still read it. Four, you can't. Five, six. You get up to seven, and it's just there. So, I don't know. I like the blurring better. But that's the different obfuscation modes. Um, there's some other features down here, rotating, but I don't ever use those. Two rotations. There's uh, resizing, which is interesting. So it's 883 pixels. I can cut it roughly in half, go 440. It'll shrink it down. But no, I never do that. So I'll do it. And the reason why is because I can uh, take this full image paste it into Outlook or paste it into my Word document, and I can resize it to fit there. And I would rather have a more accurate, larger, accurate as in more pixels and, and looks better, better resolution. I'd rather have a bigger, better resolution image that I'm shrinking down inside of those apps than shrinking it down here, and then if I need to raise it back up in size, I can't. So I usually don't use the resize and none of these. Uh, I do use the obfuscate for security, and I do also use the effects. Uh, the cropping I don't really use because when I take the original screenshot, I cropped it. But I could crop it and highlight an area, and if I were to hit enter, it would resize the screen with only those contents. But I'm going to hit escape. All right, I'm going to hit this little red cancel. So here is the last set of effects we're going to go through, and this is where there's a bunch. Uh, border, I don't use. It's not very good. Invert, I don't use. It just flips it black. I, I don't like that. It inverts colors. Grayscale, yeah. Here, let me draw something in red on. If I do a grayscale, the layer behind, which is the original image, all color is removed. But the layer that has all my drawings, the color stays. But I don't like the grayscale. I don't really have a use for it that often. Uh, the drop shadow hits okay. Click on that, gives a line with a shadow. But sometimes I use that, but not that often. What I do use all the time is the torn edge. And if I right click on torn edge, it gives me the menu. I typically leave these settings all the same, but these I'll change. If I want to have all four torn edges, there we go, all four torn edges. Undo, left click, right click. Maybe I want it to have a crisp, crisp, sharp edge and look like the lower right side of my screen. Well, I leave these unchecked and check those two. And voila, it looks like I'm at the lower right of the screen and I cut it off the left part and I cut off the upper part. So I really like the torn edge. And finally on the agenda, we're going to discuss using the image, the screenshot that you've taken. We'll demo how to do that in Outlook and in so now my screenshot is complete and I finished it off and put a border around it. The next thing I always do is I go right up to the clipboard here and I click that button. That copies my image to the clipboard. And now we're going to demonstrate with Outlook how I might use that. So I'd have a subject line, I would send it to someone. Um, and then I would come down, type, 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 whatever it is I'm going to type. And typically I'll do like figure one, something, 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 and then I'll paste in my image. And sometimes I may indent it with tab key, have the ruler set up. 
there's some special stuff you have to do to get the ruler set up now. But anyway, there's my image. And I have my discussion up here, and maybe in parentheses I'll put figure one, and I reference it down below. And that way I keep some of my details and screenshots and stuff down below, but I can get my more salient, important points up here, and then have figure two, etc. So very handy to have a screenshot. Uh, back on the prior screen, I like to do this with arrows too sometimes. If there's three or four things going on, I'll just have an arrow that points this, this, and this. In this case, I'm highlighting the file name, what the type is, and the size for whatever reason. Um, but that is how to use Screenshot in Outlook. Get rid of that, and let's go do the same thing, but let's do it in Word. Let's use the Screenshot in Word. And a trick I learned with Word is... Uh, you know, maybe you have a bunch of text. I should have done the Ipsum Orum uh, generator. So there we go. A whole bunch of text. I should probably have it uh, done up at one and a half line spacing. So there we go. Now, sometimes if I want it to look nice, oh, actually, let's just make a whole bunch of text here. There we go. Sometimes what I'll do, let's see, like right here, let's say I'm on a break. I will go and I will insert a table, two cells, and I will take, oh, I already lost my uh, image in the clipboard. So I gotta go back here, hit the clipboard again. I have my image, paste my image in, it's giant. Click it, shrink it down. Now scroll wheel, kind of zoom in here, shrink it down some more, and then what I can do is take my text, I don't know, let's try about that much of my text, throw it in here, not all, get a bit more of the text, and back off this little bit, paste it back there, so now I've got my text lined up, I didn't lose any, I can well, see how the this and then it indents, so I'll actually grab, now it's all lined up, and I'll highlight my table, and I'll go to the boxes and say no border, and voila. Now I have my text flowing, and I have an image, and I may often go to the left here, hit a shift enter, move it down one, figure one, blah, 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 blah. Make that bold, oops, bold, italic. Maybe we could move it smaller font and maybe have the uh, spacing at one. There we go, and it all flows nicely. Here, I'm gonna have to back it off a little bit. Oh, wrong way. It's, uh, move the space after the paragraph. There we go. Now it all flows at one and a half line, all nicely down. And I can take and highlight this paragraph and I can write just, or uh, uh, there's a problem there. It, eh. Anyway, there's a way to get around that too. You copy some of these, manually put in the spaces and then you can have it all lined up, but uh, I'll just undo it. But that's how you can get an embedded image and have the text flow around it. Thanks for watching Matt's Garage Projects, and please like or subscribe to this channel.